evening. Um, so I'm Dr. Brittany Brinkman. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am um, uh, the co-convener of this group with um, Jose, and I'm a psychology professor at Point Park. Um, and if we could maybe popcorn around, name where you're coming from, um, and uh, maybe one, just like one word about how, how you're feeling today. So um, I'm a little frazzled. You might have heard the beginning the, or the tail end of the conversation in my car got hit last night, but everyone's fine. Everyone's safe. And so I'm dealing with it, but just a little frazzled today. Um, Jose, are you, are you good to start or do you want us to wait? I think he's getting settled. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Tasha, will you uh, introduce yourself? Thanks. Hello, Tasha Bonner Johnson, pronouns she, her. Um, I work for New Voices for Reproductive Justice. And I guess this will be my first time saying it, but in a new position there, um, working with their youth organizing. So now I'm over all of youth organizing for New Voices. So um, excited and anxious. I wasn't quite sure what word would make both of those together, but um, that's kind of where I'm at. And I will pick Ashley. Congrats, Tasha. That's exciting. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Hill. I'm an assistant professor in um, the Department of Epidemiology at Pitt Public Health. Um, and my uh, research work kind of focuses on um, sexual and reproductive health for um, minority girls. So I'm glad to be able to continue to collaborate in this space. Uh, I will pick Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay. I'm, I work at State Representative Covington's office here in District 24. Um, and I couldn't hear the question that you posed at the beginning, if you don't mind repeating that. Sure, um, just how are you feeling today? Oh, great, great. Um, you know, our team is slowly growing, so it's really nice to have that, you know, in in office work environment start again and have a good team to be with. So good. Um, and I'll pass it on to Melissa. Hi, I just joined the week meeting, but I'm Melissa. I'm I'm from PAR. Um, I'm not sure what the other questions were though. <laughs> uh, pronouns and how you're feeling today. Okay. Melissa, she, her, hers. Um, I'm feeling motivated, but busy and scattered at the same time, trying to sort through things. So. Um, and I'm not sure who didn't go yet. I'll pass it off to whoever didn't go yet. I can jump in. I'm Tishara, she, her pronouns. I am the research coordinator for Gwen's Girls and the Black Girls Equity Alliance. Good to see folks again. It's been a while since I've been able to tune into the health and wellness meeting. Um, and I am feeling excited today because later on I am going to my first skating lesson. I'm learning how to roller skate. And I will pass it on to Rachel. Hi, uh, I'm Rachel Perry. I am the community educator at Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania. Um, I am mostly just sitting in and listening and taking notes since Christine Gordon can't be here today and is, is typically um, a much bigger voice in these great meetings. Um, but I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling in a flow. Um, and I use she and they pronouns. And I will um, pass to Sarah. Uh, so there's two Sarahs, so I'll go. Um, I'm Sarah Pessy. I'm a policy associate with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Um, and what was the qu the question? Is how are we? F how are you feeling today? Um, good and busy and I'll um popcorn to whoever wants to go next I'll go since I'm the other Sarah I'm Sarah Nevels I am the intake and pre-diversion coordinator supervisor department super I'm sorry <laughs> intake and pre-diversion department supervisor for Gwen's girls and I am 
hopeful today. I've been, I spent the last two days in meetings with the city of Pittsburgh police, um, a number of providers, resolve, crisis response, all um, positive stuff, all looking at doing a better job of crisis response and doing a better job of um, creating safety in our communities and neighborhoods in a culturally responsive way. I cannot see anyone else on my screen, so I will pass it to whomever. I can go. Um, hi, I'm Joni Schwager. I'm the director of the Staunton Farm Foundation. We give behavioral health grants in 10 counties in southwestern Pennsylvania. And um, Sarah, who went to the, said you were just at the meeting, was this the meeting about with uh, um, the sequential intercept mapping out of curiosity? Because Bethany, exactly. who works in my office, was there. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. Oh, I just, I just, I just had a whole hour cool. finding out about it. Okay, it thank you. Title, and I didn't know if anybody would know what that meant. But I do, be, just because she was invited. And I yeah. go by the pronouns she, her, and hers. Thanks. I'm going to go. Um, Jose Garth, I'm the... Um, co-convener of the Health and Wellness Group, as well as the site director at e Places for a downtown site. Um, I am feeling very hopeful as my niece drives me somewhere. Um, we're going we're going to a dense point for them. So it's my first time having them drive me anywhere. So I'm feeling fingers crossed. -y. Um, <laughs> I use he, they pronouns. Um, and hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I'll be somewhere where I'm not moving in a car and I can be more attentive to the meeting. I can go. Um, Tammy Patterson, Women's Law Project, and I am feeling pretty good today. And I'll pass it on to Kip. Thank you. Um, I'm Kip Dawson. I'm a retired Pittsburgh public school teacher, activist with the Education Rights Network and with Teen Screen. Um, and very in inspired by this organization um, as schools are going to be starting with a bunch of kids who really need support and families who do as well. Uh, today, I'm feeling inspired and concerned, inspired by the people of Kansas and by the way that the people of um, Eastern Kentucky have come together across racial and class lines to help each other through the flooding down there. I'm a retired coal miner also, and I know people down there, and I think that they, these two places, the two Ks, Kentucky and Kansas, give us a lot of hope for humanity, really, in, in these very difficult times. And I'm very grateful to the Black Girls Equity Alliance for helping us prepare to be ready to support the nurses and counselors and parents and teachers, and especially the children as school is about to start. And I think everyone has now spoken, am I right? I think so. If if we, if we missed you, um, speak up. I think we got everybody. Well, th thank you all so much for being here. Um, we really, as always, appreciate everyone's time and collective energy. Um, Kip, I appreciate that so much, sort of like the, the inspired and worried and um, feels like the emotions of the time right now, right? So, but I know for me, coming to this group is always um, part of the getting to be inspired and, and work together. So thank you all for being here today. Um, so our planned agenda for today, um, we actually have an update on um, some movement on the policy, exit policy at PPS. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit and really, I think, um, are ready to mobilize around community support um, to get that passed. Um, so we'll talk about that. We have a few updates about the chalk out event to address street harassment, um, and then um, some updates about mental health. Um, and I would love if, as much as Sarah Nevels as you have are, are able to share with us, um, like some of the stuff that's happening at the city, you know, the citywide level um, around health and safety um, updates there as well. Um, Anything else that people want to, to add to our agenda? Ooh. 
Um, please feel free to jump in any time or add things that are happening. Um, and we'll make time at the end to for like um, events that are going on uh, that you want people to be aware of that we can uh, make sure that we support. So. Um, so one of the things we've been working on for well for months in the group and then the last few of these meetings in particular uh, is working to get um, PPS to pass a new revised policy around comprehensive sex ed. Um, we have we, a subgroup of ours worked with some members of the school board to write the policy. Um, we've just been kind of waiting to find out when it when it seems like it's going to make it um, onto the agenda. Um, so we just found out. Uh, from Pam Harbin that it is slated to go on to the agenda on Monday. It looks like I'm going to pull up, be kind of rude and pull up my email and read because I don't want to give all of us inaccurate information here. Too many tabs open. Maybe I'll get there. All right. Um, while I find that, um, I cannot. Um, I can walk and do a lot of things at the same time, but I cannot talk and, you know, look and read my email. Apparently, um, so I'll pull this up in a second. What I would like us to do today: we started a draft of an open letter to the school board to to ask them to pass the policy. So I'd like us to review that and get that ready to roll so we can send it out to our network. Um, and then also do kind of a one pager. What can we send out, share with each other, and then send out more broadly for how people can mobilize to support um, getting the policy signed um, or getting the policy passed. Uh, we have not heard of any pushback or we haven't heard board members who are planning not to support it. So, but we just wanna be ready as we have all seen, uh, sometimes we're surprised with what happens. There, there's always been some resistance to comprehensive, culturally responsive sex ed. It's often by a very loud but small group of parents. Um, so it's possible that there will be some pushback or that board members might feel like unsure about how much parents and community members are are supportive. So we just want to be ready to to show the support for passing this policy. Uh, and you know, maybe it'll just be a super smooth process, but we want to mobilize to to just get us ready as ready as possible to do that. So the steps uh, for the process, it goes to the policy board, the policy workshop uh, first. Um, so that is going to be on August 8th at 6 p.m. And uh, the public is able to watch the meeting. And I'm gonna drop this link in our chat here. We, uh, this is not the, like the school board meeting isn't, this isn't when it gets voted on or when we, when the public is open to like testify about it. But the policy workshop is when the board discusses proposed policy and start to have sort of a conversation about it. So it will be really helpful for people to view and get a sense of how much support we do have at this stage or questions or concerns that might be coming up or if there are board members who are expressing that they aren't gonna be in support. So we'll be able to have a little bit of a sense of that um, after this meeting. Um, and then my understanding, please someone correct me if, if I'm getting this wrong, but my understanding is then uh, typically things that are approved at this meeting or are discussed at this meeting, then go to the, to the board meeting for a vote. So this, this is the first meeting of like, here's the proposed policies. Um, I don't know for sure if policies can be, you know, shot down at this stage. I, I don't know that. Um, we can try to find that out. But um, but we don't really, the public isn't invited to comment until the next stage. So likely the, the school board meeting in August will be the one that will, this will be on the public agenda. At that meeting, people are invited to provide testimony about anything they want, really. Um, and that would be our opportunity to really um, put our support out. I do think that once this is on this agenda, though, we can put out the, the open letter, we can get people to be writing emails to their school board members. Um, we can start publicly advocating for it because it, it's 
this is a public hearing, so anybody could see it happen, um, but we but people aren't able to actually testify until the next meeting. Great. Do you mind sharing yeah. the August school board meeting is? Do we know? Um, I think it is on the school board's website, so I will look it up. It is. It's, I think it's usually the third week of the month. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it should be it should be two weeks out. Um, but we'll uh, y'all try to look it up right now. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. So then, as far as the mobilization plan that you all have been thinking about, does that mean that we're thinking of ways to mobilize for Monday and for the school board meeting? Yeah. So for Monday's meeting, we are. Please, anybody, if I get stuff wrong. Don't hesitate to correct me, but my understanding is that the policy meeting, the public can view but not participate. So mm -hmm. we won't be able to to submit testimony, but we can certainly push out the open letter, which I would suggest we do. So this is part of today is like let's strategize about how we want to go. We've intentionally waited until at least the stage. We didn't necessarily want to mobilize the opposition, um, but now once this is out there, people will know. So I think that like on the 8th maybe we want to put out our open letter okay. get that out and then and then start garnering people wow. prepare them to plan to testify um and i think people could already start like contacting their um school board um like their representatives um and then the actual like testimony would happen at the next meeting yeah so, so we, have, what do you all think about that we can definitely so the eighth will give us context as to what we're going to be doing. The chair and the co-chair of the policy committee are very much for this. Both of them have attended now this group's meetings, but also the education work group. And um, I think even juvenile justice because um, because uh, Gene Walker works does work that well. That too. So they're 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 very pro and very there for it. So that's a huge 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 win so far. Um, and the actual board meeting where we can testify. I don't know yet, I'm still looking up. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think at this point we have we have fairly firm commitments from one, two, three, three board members. Um, I think a, a few have said, yeah, we think we would support this. Um, and like we said, I we haven't gotten anyone that's clearly said they are in opposition. Um, so I think we're in a good state, but I think it's still helpful for us to be ready to just be vocally saying, you know, so that if there's any questions or if they get, you know, a few random loud parents screaming at them that they know we also, I think one of our roles potentially with the school, with the school district in general is like, sometimes we're, you know, encouraging <laughs> and also sometimes we're like supporting, right. And, and that push or that, that that pressure and energy can work in both ways so if if most of the school board members are are loving this and they want to support it anyway we don't really need to push but it might be that what we're doing is providing some leverage that supports them right we're pushing the public and we're speaking out so it gives them some look all these people want it these you know so and i think we don't know if how much it's going to be a push versus a like we could be the force, the pub, the community force that they can also like lean on us. That if any, if they get pushed back from parents saying, "Well, I've heard all these people support it, and these these expert experts, whatever, um, are on board, whatever." So, I think we can. How much we need to language how we testify. I think we'll have a sense of that. Um, if it's just like, "Yay, we're you know do what you think you want to do anyway, and we have your back," or if it's like having to be a little more convincing. Um, I think we'll know that on Monday. And even if even if everybody agrees to it and, and, it, and it pushes through, there's still a huge education piece. Because even for the folks that are on the board that are for this, we're still in the process of getting them a fuller understanding of what we're what we're asking for. Because um, you know, it's a very nuanced and and continuously changing topic that we're trying to keep them up to date on. So that way they have what they need to push forward. And then once it gets past the board, obviously the administration and the teachers and whatnot, not, we still have to work with to keep them up to date. The policy is written in a way to do that, but we know that there's accountability measures and things that we're gonna need to continue to do to make sure what's in the policy happens if it gets passed. 
Absolutely. So I think one of the things that we can talk about today is what what info should we put all the stuff that Jose and I are like, we know this somewhere, right? Like, let's put that on a one pager. So we're sending that out to people. Here's this meeting. Here's this meeting. Here's the steps. And then I do think, you know, if we have the time today to at least discuss or somebody has the capacity for, again, one pager for school board members, here's some talking points, here's some facts. Here's, you know, giving them some tools. So if they get pushback or questions, as Jose is saying, that they are like, I support this, but I'm this isn't their area of expertise, right? And we're not expecting them to do that. We can give them, you know, some information and also like they can say, like, read that, look at this website, or you know, ask this person, <laughs> right? So again, I think that that role that we could play that is more in that we're supporting the, sc the school board members and not just um, having to sort of push them, push them along. Um, thoughts or questions so far? Okay. Um, the draft for the open letter is in our drive. So I'm going to put the link in here and then I will also put it up, share my screen so people can, can see. I think we're in a good place with it, but definitely, like I said, any and all feedback is, is, is strongly encouraged and welcome. And we're looking, and you know, I said this after, like my internet going out. Um, oh. We're looking for folks to sign, not just in, as individuals, which we welcome that, but also we're trying to get organizations to sign on too, because there's a lot of power to that. So, um, yeah, I agree with that. And I, my, I think this is our priority to finish today, so that we can get it to Kathy to look at, and then we can push it out to, you know, to the network and distribute it. Because I think if we get this shared on on Monday, we can keep working on the, you know, here's the next steps for things that people can um, contribute to or what they need to do next. See if I can enlarge this. Okay, can. I'm just gonna let everyone read. I know it's not the most engaging Zoom meeting when we're all quiet, but Um, yes, Rachel, to your question, we the I pulled all this from I changed some of the wording, but I pulled it a lot of it from the policy. So the policy is intended to to state that we expect ongoing training so that it's not a one end to end kind of thing. Oh yeah, thanks, Joni. scroll down sorry for and i would say we appreciate yeah. the opportunity not we have appreciated we appreciate the opportunity okay i mean yeah we can definitely do that we have a okay. we have, sorry no no you're fine um
Brittany, I was just wondering yeah. if you think it would be worthwhile to say anything about as positively as possible, but anything about the previous engagement that we've had with key members of the Board of Education and Pittsburgh Public Schools broadly so that it can really demonstrate the fact that this has been a very long ongoing relationship um, and that in that partnership, there's been a lot that we've recommended that we have in writing that mm -hmm. can be presented at whatever point they're willing to listen. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And especially with this, board members have collaborated really directly. And so I, I do want to try to have that in there in a way that's clear that we've been part of this process, it's been collaborative thus far. And now, you know, we really need the final vote. So I think that's that's a good rec or a good suggestion. Right now, the only sort of clear ask I have is what's in bold, which is adopt it. But if anybody thinks we need a, I mean, a different ask or another ask, we can definitely put that in there. But it seems like that at this point, what we want is all clearly spelled out in the policy. And I pulled in a few things so people see those highlighted, but that we're asking them to approve it. Um, but if if there's something else you think we need in there, please please uh, let me know. Um, Kip, I can't tell, are you, did, is that a raised hand? Yes, yes, yes please. Yes, um, I, yeah. I, I, you have so much experience that please help us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think this is perfect. I, I have no suggestions about revising this, but I think that we need to understand that one obstacle to having it actually implemented in the schools is the, the sparsity of counselors, school counselors um, who are in a position actually to do that kind of work combined with what we can anticipate is going to be the big increase in need. Um, I think that we can we can guess that in this really misogynist atmosphere in which we are now living, there is going to be an increased amount of, of apprehension and actually negative experience that girls and boys and all people of all gender, kids of all genders, are going to come to school with this fall. And um, we are we are facing a situation where we already had a lack of personnel in the schools to be able to help them, and we instead had, as we know, a punishment alternative for kids who were acting up. So um, I, I just I, I'm sure I'm not saying anything new to anybody, but this is what really concerns me as we move forward. I think this coalition is so important. And I really tip my hat to every single person who's here and all the work that's been done. Um, and just hope that we are ready to back up our school nurses and um, our counselors. And, you know, I'm a retired English teacher. People laugh about it, but English teachers are kind of like counselors too, partly because we spend more time with kids. We have longer teaching periods. Um, a lot of teachers play that kind of role. But in the atmosphere in which people are trying to do that right now, um, it's going to be more difficult and people are going to be scared. I want to salute our city council, which I don't often do, but I think it's really marvelous that the steps that um, our city government is taking to indicate their being with these the kids and the, and the schools. Um, I, we're gonna need everybody in all of this. And so um, making this happen in the school board meeting is incredibly important, but I think in the discussions at the board meeting too, it's gonna to be important for people to raise this side of it, the implementation side. Um, so thank you for making this happen though, really, this is so important. No, just, no go ahead. No, go, go please. Okay. I was just going to say thank you um, for saying that, Kip, because school board meetings are now going to be contentious. And how, you know, how have you thought about dealing with that? I mean, people are getting threatened. And I mean, I'm sure you read everything that I read. Um, and I don't know if that's something that you're concerned about, but I certainly would be. Okay, Jose. Yeah, no, I, I, I was going to say, um, 
you're right, right, Mr. Austin, that we, this is a big step that I feel we're going to succeed in, um, but it's a big step that's like one of many. Implementation's often the harder lift, um, mainly because I think, what, there's 28 different schools in Pittsburgh Public Schools that we're looking at. Um, even with the wide network we have within the VGA, we don't have the power to oversee 28 schools um, between our organizations. We're not in all 28 schools. Um, most of the people who are actually doing this work in the schools are the um, health teachers and also some of the nurses and some of the health teachers for that matter are not for this work. I've talked to, I've talked to nurses that didn't want to provide pads and tampons, nurses that felt like you know, the idea of giving out condoms is not one that we should ever think to even mention. And this is just some, I've had nurses who were walking a gray area of whether or not they can give kids condoms and we're giving them out just because they didn't want to ask for permission. They'd rather ask for forgiveness. So like it, 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 it there, there is, there's the spectrum of support from school to school and from department to department. Um, I feel a lot of the heavy work's going to be after this, how do we strategize to get the resources. Um, the city doesn't control what happens in PPS. But the city can get funding to give us the resources to get more people in, more outside providers, which I think is really much better than having the health teachers do it. A lot of the health teachers are not equipped. Even the ones that want to do this, they're just not equipped to do it. Um, so there, I don't even go with it. That's just to say there's a lot of work beyond this first step. Um, and this is going to be, this is a really big step. A lot of work's going into it. But, it, you know, I, I don't, as much as I want to celebrate after we get this through, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain we're going to, um, I don't want us to, you know, I want us to realize we got a lot of work coming after that too. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good question and and probably one that we could have on our sort of, you know, fact sheet, right? Um, because it is one that should people should be asking. And so my, and I, I think Jose is answering it in the sense of, where are we and where do we need to go? And my understanding of the revised policy is that it includes languaging to of what the expectations are for the existing teachers, health teachers, nurses who are providing sex education now, um, how they should update those expectations, uh, as well as training for people in those roles, as well as some guidance about how to include outside organizations who can come in to provide. So I think it's a, it's an important question and one we should be prepared to help offer an answer of how is this going to happen. And part of it is some sex education is happening right now, but more support is needed to make sure it's meeting these standards. And then also to Jose's point, more is needed, right? We need the right people doing it. We need training for the people who want to be doing it. And we need support for outside organizations to, to come in. So I'm really glad you raised it because it's a really um, practical question to be asking if we're going to ask for different curriculum than it currently exists, who's implementing it and how's that going to happen. And I think it's one of the things that teachers fairly push back on, right? Is like community groups, and the board have come at PPS for years, do this, do that, do that. And if there's not always support for how to get it done, it, it falls on the shoulders of teachers. And I think sometimes the teachers union has just been like, don't tell us any more things to do because we have enough on our plate. So it's it's a really good point and something I think we can we can speak to. We don't, to Jose's point is like, we don't have the full resources available, but here's what exists and where we're headed. Yeah, Kip, go ahead. Okay, I, what you just said is really important. Um, back when I was teaching, and I've been retired now for four years, so talking way before um, COVID, PAR, I'm really glad there's somebody here from PAR. PAR used to come into seventh and eighth grade classrooms and do really good education about sexual harassment. And um, they would be in the classrooms for, um, three or four times in a row. And so the kids got to know the presenters and actually did activities with them. And that was awesome. Um, that was an awesome experience. It's an example of the kind of way that community groups not only can, but already have uh, supported this work in our schools. 
Um, I, you know, as a middle school teacher, I thought that that timing on them coming at that time was so important because, well, for all the reasons that we know, it was developmentally appropriate. And our kids responded well to that. Um, if the person who's here from PAR knows if they would be willing to do this again, that could be one specific thing that some of us could raise as something that has worked in the past that costs the schools nothing, but that um, it is an important help to the kids. On the teachers union, um, as somebody who's been on the executive board of that union, beating my head up against brick walls for a long time, I want to apologize for the way that the teachers union sometimes, the officers of the teachers union are become an obstacle to the work that we really need to do. Um, and for example, around school police, I, I, I think it's a shame, and, but it's a reality right now here in Pittsburgh. It's not true everywhere, but here in Pittsburgh, we have that problem. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, continue to try to, um, to bring them on board because mm -hmm. goodness knows in times that we're in right now, we don't have time for the nonsense of, um, for, for, we, don't, we don't have time for that kind of stuff. Yeah, Melissa or, or um, Tasha or anyone that, um, if you want to speak to organizations that are providing some of the um, sex ed in schools now, I think it's a really good point that we should name that, uh, you know, maybe not in this one page, but have it ready, like if someone asks, who's going to do it? Here's organizations who are already doing it. So um, I know a few of the people in the, in the call are, this is your bread and butter. Yeah, sure. And thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Dawson. I was actually thinking as I was reading this that I don't know if we need to put this in this draft, but just in the back of my mind, I was thinking how important this is to the work that we do at my agency, because if um, if children don't have a basic, basic knowledge of sex education, like how are we going to keep them safe um, from experiencing like victimization and such. So this is really at the root um, to some of the work that we do at PAR. Um, I can't tell you, I, I'm uh, from the clinical department and, and the counsel, family and counseling center. And I can't tell you how many children I've processed um, their trauma with, and they didn't know what was going on because they had no sex education. So this is really at the root of things, um, really at the root of keeping people safe is knowing what good touch and bad touch is and what's appropriate and what's not and such. Um, but we do have an education and prevention department still at par um, that does act is actually still very involved in the school, um, not in all of the Pittsburgh public schools, but a handful of the Pittsburgh public schools. We still have, um, Gail is, is wonderful. I think she's been with us for 20 years now. Um, and she has, um, uh, some study relationships with a few of the schools that she still does a lot of um, sex education in. Uh, so that's something that we are still doing and currently doing and isn't going to change. Um, and I'm sure if um, we could even expand upon that as well. That's a huge part of what our education and prevention department does. Um, so that's something we currently offer to some of the Pittsburgh public schools and can continue to offer and expand upon as well. I'll just speak to what we're doing at Planned Parenthood as well, um, which is also very similar. We're in some of the schools, not all of the schools. Uh, right now, we sort of contact individual teachers, usually health teachers directly and set up those programs one at a time. So we're really excited about the prospect of having this, this policy um, be implemented countywide so that we can do things like teacher trainings as well. Um, so all, yeah, we are excited to be able to support the new need because this has been the need the whole time. Yeah, my, my hope and those of you that have been around for a while and know that I'm always like kind of working up the same like two or three trees um, <laughs> is that, you know, we can build capacity um, within organizations uh, and, and get funding to actually grow what this work is. I feel a lot of organizations that are here and that aren't here. So, you know, UPMC and Pitt has done work. Adagio has done some work around this. Planned Parenthood has done work with this. Um, you know, New Voices has done work with this. There's so many organizations that have done it, but fragmented um, different focuses 
Um, also, nobody that I know of has done anything for K through five in Pittsburgh, um, which is part of this policy is to support sex ed for pre K through five. <laughs> um, so th there's a lot of capacity going there. Um, you know, it's been said before, and I'll keep on saying it. We need to find the funds to make providers and pay providers to provide high quality sex ed. Um, there's not enough people who are able to do that in the city right now. Um, and if there are, there's not enough money to pay them all right now. Um, so, you know, as it stands, if this gets passed next month, PPS is going to roll it out and it's going to be up to the health teachers to do it. And, you know, we can provide training for the health teachers. We've done that before, but I can tell you after providing training for the health teachers, they need more than a one day training. They need more than a three hour training or four hour training. Um, even the ones who once again are really invested in this, they're not there yet. Cause once again, this is very nuanced stuff. It's changing and evolving and it takes people who can do this on a full-time basis um, and people that can support it in a full-time basis. And that requires money. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping we can, we can, we can, we can get there where we can actually start trying to build some of that out and grow some capacity and see what, you know, see if HAR wants to extend the work that y'all are doing. And as far as like, you know, the funding needs to go to foundation or not foundation, needs to go to organizations and we need to figure out what that looks like. I think that's like the next, one of the next big steps. Um, I think that also hold, puts us in a place where we got to hold um, the mayor's team accountable because Ganey has said a lot about this. Um, Ganey spoke up a lot about reproductive rights. He spoke up a lot about the need for these pieces like sex ed and, 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 and gender equity um, and about this, um, you know, public private partnerships and all this. So like, you know, when we get to this next step, you know, we got to see like, okay, you say you're talking to these foundations, get these foundations to the table to pay up to be able to take care of some of this work because it's not a light lift. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to need something to pick it up. So this is really great, everybody. Oh, sorry. I just want to comment. I'm trying to capture some of this in here. So I would love like some of people's feedback on a couple of these things. So I definitely think Melissa, you're right. I think we should have a statement in here cl being clear. And this is something we, you know, we do always talk about that comprehensive sex ed is part of sexual violence prevention. So we can, you know, definitely want feedback on wordsmithing that. Um, one question for the group is whether we want to we want to go the Title IX, you're legally required to do this route, or the this is the moral thing to do route, or or neither necessarily. But we could sort of let leverage that in there, and then I think we can add at least a sentence clarifying that the policy will be applicable to internal providers and community organizations who are providing training and direct um, education in the schools. Uh, thoughts about either of those things. Sorry, Melissa, I didn't mean to cut you off. Please go ahead. Yeah. No, that's okay. I was trying to figure out on my own how to finish the, the wording of the oh. sentence that you had. <laughs> that I was just, not there. It's like, da, 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 you know. <laughs> I was just going to say to you in response to what Jose mentioned, um, talking about the funding, like I was thinking to myself, like, Yes, like, you know, the education and prevention department would like to expand to go to other schools, but it would require us to have more staff because I'm thinking of just like where we're staffed at right now. So I'm sure if we were able to find funding streams to hire more staff to go, we would certainly do that. But that's definitely the next um, step. Um, I was also in the wording of the sentence trying to think about if it would be valuable. This might be too much for the statement. But one thing I think about when I think of sexual violence and trauma and how it's affecting children um, is the ACE score, that aversive childhood experiences, and um, you know how it could help help reduce that score if they don't experience the victimization and impact positively impact their well being and health. Um, I was just trying to think in my mind if um, somehow putting that in a sentence would be helpful at all. I'll think about it. Yeah, even if it if it's too much to land here to like explain ACEs, I think it could definitely go on our talking points sheet, right? So why should we do this? Well, this can lead to lower levels of childhood trauma and that we know. So because I think we can have some talking points that people can go deeper into that they might include in testimony, they might 
you know, include in talking. So um, definitely like jot down notes and send them because if it doesn't land, if it's too much to land here, I think it could definitely land in other useful places. Can I kind of say, uh, um, I, I have some issues with ACES because it is not um, taking into account racial trauma at all, which is a, a really big component that is happening in, in, in is present in many of our communities that does that that is one of the aces but it's not in the aces actual questionnaire but it is absolutely an indicator of trauma yeah i'm, I'm with you there but also i feel just the, the the recognition of just trauma whether we use aces or not or just you know i think it's a great talking point because you, you know um you're right this is this the, the the, the thing about comprehensive sex ed is that it, it covers so much of just the human experience and for better or worse trauma is a huge part of that and childhood trauma i'd say even more so <laughs> um so you know ad addressing that as a part of this issue i think it's really really important especially as um even not not the achievement anyway but even as we talk about funding like there's a lot of there's a lot of Comes with mental health and race for reception and reproductive health right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think I think it's definitely worth mentioning um, however we want to frame it. So one of my frustrations sometimes when I am, you know, because I lead the intake department, I now I am the intake department. Um, one of my frustrations is when I say the word comprehensive sex education, you see parents, you see people just shrivel up like, oh my God, we're gonna talk about sex. And what people really don't understand is that comprehensive sex education is also body positivity. It is also self-esteem building. It's also self-awareness. It's not just about penises and vaginas, right? It's not just about the act of sex. It is so much more. And I think sometimes that gets lost when you say sex. Yeah, I think these are really great discussions. Um, I'm going to be the like uber pragmatist a little bit for a second and ask another question of the group for because I think we want to keep this to a one pager as much as possible. Uh, I we can take out stuff too. So should I take out this? I again, I cut and paste some from the policy. Um, I think what we're talking through are the key things we know we want in here. Uh, so I could cut out the state in the policy that board that reflects the board's commitment to provide. Um, students from pre-K to graduation, dot, 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 dot. Um, I, obviously, we think that's important information. It's in the policy. It's taking up a lot of retail space on this open letter. So feedback on removing that or other things, I think I can, um, uh, actually, what you wrote, I like a lot. And I think I can cut a lot of this stuff up here. Um, um, if we do decide to remove it, I would yeah. just ask for it that we hold space for it, maybe in a separate document, because I definitely feel like this entire open letter is something that could actually be an op-ed if it has a few tweaks. And if so, we would want to include that one through five so people, the general public, would know what we're talking about. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with that. Sometimes the like downside to Google Docs is it goes away forever, but I, I do okay. think that the, the things that are here are really important. Um, and I know we were kind of talking a little bit about funding, and I just want to say I'm sort of on the I'm on the lookout for funding mechanisms. I think it would be useful for this group if our funding mechanisms were um, applied through one of the um, service-based organizations, and I would say probably not a university organization, um, because I think that there's less red tape about how the funds can be applied and. Um, what they can be used for. And so I think that there are a few things that we may be interested in looking at. That's, I think, a longer process, but I want to just bring that up that I will um, start to share some mechanisms I think could be useful um, if any of the groups here feel like that would be worthwhile to pursue. How much money do you think you need? So um, Jose and I worked on something with a budget and it was looking kind of close to $100,000 for like a two year implementation. So the training, um, the actual like supplies that would be necessary and then being able to kind of buy out time from the school systems for the, the teachers to be able to do some of these things. 
um, and even potentially having a full-time person within the school board that can do some of the evaluation. So that was kind of something that we put together for a different proposal altogether, but I think could be really useful to sort of conceptualize what this might need to look like on, you know, this type of level. So if we're looking for the school board to be able to adopt something, can we hire somebody that kind of, you know, does the evaluation and implementation pieces? We kind of, as a volunteer organization, do a lot of the um, consultation on that, but really so that we can remove all barriers that would be, you know, potentially suggested when it comes down to time and resources um, to adopt and implement something like this. This is great. Uh, so I think let's keep, if we can land on a place where the group feels good, leaving the letter doesn't have to be final, final, but at least we can get it to Kathy and some edits if we think we wanna to try to get it pushed out on Monday. And then I will start a couple of new Google Docs that we can work on as a group uh, over, you know, after the meeting uh, for talking points, uh, it's a document that we could share with anybody, whether it's a board member or someone who wants to, um, submit testimony, and then a how do I, what do I do if I want to support this, uh, that can just be, you know, how do I sign up, how do I watch this, so I think those two documents we can, we can work on, we have not, not tons and tons of time, but a little bit of time uh, between the policy meeting and um, getting those out, but uh, definitely, I think this group has been so, so helpful in figuring out, you know, what do we want to say as a group about, um, about this policy. Other thoughts of things people feel like we definitely want in here or that we should remove. Tasha, I know I'm not, I'm not trying to like call you in, but if there's anything, you know, I know you've worked so much on this that if you have other things that you feel like this, you know, this letter's missing or you want to make sure we get in here. Yeah, so far it looks, I mean, it looks good. I'm trying to go back and forth and look at the two, depending on the edits that we made, but so far it looks good. Oh, thank you. Just want to say kudos to the group i mean all of this is just an excellent example of organizing and mobilization so y'all are bomb thank you thanks i agree thank you everybody so much so uh i will keep this in here for a stage of this um we'll get it to kathy um to shira if you'll also help us with some editing get the final version out and then it'll come back around because i think if everyone, if you feel, if you can sign on as an individual, if you have an organization that could sign on, uh, my sense is let's get what we can. We can always do add-ons. What we did when we did the test of testimony around the sexual harassment piece a few years ago was we had an open letter that we distributed, but we also brought it to the school board hearing. So we can definitely add more signatures as we go. Um, but I, I think unless somebody, if someone disagrees, I think it's wise of us to, to push this out Monday after the, you know, since the pub, the policy meeting is going to happen. I think we want to get right out in front of this. So cool. all right, I'm going to stop sharing so everyone can see people's faces more and um, you don't have to multitask quite so much. <laughs> Other things, so Jose, um, other things that we want to try. I'm aware, you know, we still have like some time left, but other things that we want to make sure we get to today. Um, there's a lot of things I want to mention, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I think for the day, <laughs> that's really good for the sex ed piece. Um, next meeting, I definitely come back around to these other huge things we got coming in front of us. But <laughs> I do have a question. Are we, I mean, it sounds like we're not about to talk about the street harassment part today, 
which is fine. Are we going to have another meeting about that? Or are we going to wait until September's meeting to talk about that? So I actually think we can transition to update a little bit on that. So um, we are looking into how, holding this first round, this kind of pilot of it at the summit. We, you know, we had talked about downtown, some of the things weren't quite working out at different locations. And the date we were thinking was right the week before the summit. So it was like, why don't we just do it at the summit? We'll have a captive audience. So I think that Kathy's looking into getting like check in to make sure that we can do that space at, at Station Square. So Char, I don't know if you have any updates. Um, um, no updates aside from the fact that we're at about a 50-50. So I do want to measure expectations. The first person Kathy spoke to said, eh, I don't think that's going to be possible, but let me go and check back with my supervisor. So that's who we're waiting to hear from. Um, we made it very clear that it's just chalk. We can remove it. Um, however, they weren't very um, excited about the possibility. So I think we can find other ways to try to include it in the summit. Um, we just need to find a location that is going to make sense. And of course, y'all, the summit is the 29th and the 30th. 29th is virtual. However, we are doing the award ceremony and boat ride. So there could be something right before the boat ride, which actually was Kathy's recommendation since we want young people to participate and um, <clears throat> they would be out of school uh, immediately before the boat ride, which starts at five. Yeah, thanks. So I, I think um, I've been trying to figure this out. I don't know if somebody has a better sense of this, but like, Station Square, it runs along a public trail. <laughs> um, and so I've, I have literally Googled, like, is it legal to chalk on, you know, public trails and stuff? So I, my understanding is, is, but I don't necessarily want us to, like, the plan when we do this in Market Square, I think we're going to try to go back to doing that next spring in Market Square, is we will get a permit, but more because we do want to set up tables and have people out there. And so um, I think literally you can go chalk in Market Square and, you know, cops might come ask you what you're doing, but chalking is not considered graffiti because it's removable. But how much we want to be doing this because we're doing it and we can't, you know, versus like having, you know, the hotel like, oh yeah, that, you know, you can set up your table at our, on our space. Um, so I think it's up to the, to, you know, let's hear what they say. And then to the group to decide, like, how much this particular event is worth like challenging so, like the fine details of city law. Yeah, Tasha. Um, so a couple questions. I don't know, it might be wrapped into one. Um, are we settled, sorry, I'm playing with this camera. Are we settled on the downtown location or was it because at when we first initially started talking about it, I wanted to simultaneously do one in the East Liberty area um, around the office. So could that also be an option to, because then I can look around. I was going to kind of do what you, I wasn't asking the way to chop on the ground. So it's like right in front of the office. So we were going to just do something there. But if that needs to be a bigger space, then I'm, you know, I can ask who I need to ask or just confirm with whoever and we can still possibly use that space if we wanted to still do something prior to the um summit and then using the summit to maybe we have recorded whatever we did in East Liberty and then and use the summit then to show what we do and then move on from there so yeah yeah that might that might make a lot of sense I think the the idea with downtown it, it, you know sort of in the 2020 version of this, we had we had a permit market square. And we were going to do it there, so we might go back to that. But I think this round we were going to maybe do it at the convention center. But it sounds like that that they haven't been sort of friendly and open to it. So I think it I think that's potentially a workable solution, Tasha. If like we do a bigger thing at East Liberty, I know my my partner. Um, I've I've volunteered him to come do video and photos. He's a photographer, um, so we could definitely capture some of that and the experiences, and then maybe talk about it at the summit um, and and like kind of use that as an opportunity to share you know what we're doing if if you know we and we could kind of do both. I mean we could 
do it, you know, at New Voices. And then if we can do it at Station Square, cool. We can, you know, we can do it twice. It's chalk. I have a bunch of it. So, um, but I, I like that idea. I don't know what other, other people think. Well, and if, if, you know, if Tasha does it in East Liberty, maybe that's something we could do simultaneously in our three respective areas, which would be Wilkinsburg, the North side, Clareton might not work because that, that sidewalk, nobody travels that. Right, right. But that would be kind of cool to do it simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. And it was, we had sort of talked about having it be a multi-site approach. And so I, I like that. Like, let's, if we do it in our spaces that we have, I could see if we can do it at Point Park that same day. Because our, we have downtown space that is, you know, Point Park space. And we did a talking thing in the spring around street harassment. So um, I think we could do some multiple locations and, you know, and then like talk, talk about the project at the summit. I think too, capturing like where the youth already are, like makes a lot of sense to me, you know? So um, rather than trying to drag them to another space. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so we had, we had initially thought that Friday before the summit, I think was, um, or maybe it was two Fridays before. I think if we just do it, I, I don't know, timing wise, like it, it, and I don't even think we have to, we could do it whenever we want. But if we wanted to try to do this idea of doing it and then talking about it at the summit, which makes sense to me, um, I don't know if you all have like dates that, that you think make sense uh, in terms of your programming, like you get to run the show here. I'll show up where I can. Yeah, our girls aren't there on Friday. We don't have programming on Friday. So Friday probably wouldn't work very well for us. Um, I would say probably like a Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and I think at that point, the kids are back in school. So I don't even remember exactly what mm -hmm. our old girls, because they're going to be the ones most impacted. Yeah. Harassment. Um, I, I think our older girls are in the north side on um, Wednesdays and Thursdays, I believe. That's how it was last school year, but I'd have to check for this school year. Is it going to be the same? Yeah, initially I was looking at Thursday, the that week of the 19th. I know we just didn't settle a date. So mm -hmm. if we were going to talk about dates, that's the date that I was bringing, um, like after school time. But that's Could we, Tasha, would it work for you? Would it be too early to do the... 15th if it gives us a couple of weeks to try to then put together like you know it doesn't have to be the most put together presentation but just like some of the stuff from it for the summit might be helpful but yeah. Thursday the 15th yeah that's also an open day cool I'm not in charge of programming so I will certainly email the program supervisor for the young adults and see so you're saying Thursday the 15th of September? Yeah. Okay. All right. I will certainly email her today and see if that works. I'm so sorry. He wants to put my attention here. And I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so checked out. Okay. Um, uh, we're, we're looking to do this one, but I you probably mentioned this. We're also, you know, if we, if we get this funding, we're we looking to do another one in the spring or summer. Um, you know, because our, our original idea was that this first one would be a chance to, well, actually, I should say our original idea. One of our original ideas, we had lots of original ideas, <laughs> um, but uh, was that this would be a good way to um, really play test it and mm -hmm. then be able to expand it um, with some funding because, you know, without money, it, it limits, <laughs> limits the scope a bit, um, so. So Melissa, I know we had talked to you about having, you know, advocates. So um, I don't know what you think about if it's if we could reach out and see if an advocate could show up at, at one or more of their locations on that date. If it can, then you know we can't. Um, but yeah, once we to if make we, if we decide on crazy. Thursday, September fifteenth as a date, yeah. I can get together people to volunteer. Actually, that sounds. I'm actually probably more likely to get people together on Thursday the 15th as opposed to like um, 
I think it was like the that Friday. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more likely to get people then. And then I was going to say a Friday we couldn't do would be the 23rd. The following week, PAR has an agency thing that we're not able to do. So um, Thursday, September 15th sounds like a good date off the top of my head. Um, so once we solidify it, um, uh, I can put something together and get people to volunteer to come. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to Shira, do you want me to, or some of us to put together, like, is there space in the programming for the summit? Is that already been like figured out or? Um... Yeah, so um, it sounds like obviously this would be during two. Um, you're talking about the report out, Britt, or what mm -hmm. in particular? Yeah, sure yeah, like a kind of a report out of doing it, yeah. Gotcha. Um, so actually, this is a great time to ask you, Brittany, if you will be one of our featured speaker speakers. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> love for you to give an update at that time. But also, we are going to have uh, simultaneous workshops like we typically do happening in the afternoon on Friday. So if you all wanted for health and wellness actually to host its own uh, workshop, we would love that because I think that's another place for us to touch on just the entirety of the work you've been doing doing and then to weave the chalk out into that that's awesome cool well let me know what you need from us and I can coordinate with the group to to you know write up a little thing about it and all that but I think that I mean, the great part is that I'm the one just inputting the agenda <laughs> so you got the green light um if you can hey. just share with me a short description and then let me know who is who I should list as speakers cool thanks thank you Tasha, I'm going to put you on that list, but I'll ask you. <laughs> That's fine. I'll be doing duos. So if Tasha, okay. you know, so hopefully yeah. they won't be at the same time. We'll we'll figure it out. out. Yeah, yeah, we'll do one and one here. Yeah. Probably fine. It's awesome. This is so great. I'm so glad. I, I think that, you know, Jose and, get, and I have talked about, we do want to try to do a big thing downtown next spring. We put in a proposal with um, the FISA Foundation to fund a research and creative advocacy project. So we're hoping that'll all come together. But I think doing like a, a you know, trying it out at our, our like sites already, seeing how it goes, I think it makes a lot of sense. And so thanks everybody for, for mobilizing. And I think this, I do have a ton of chalk. So like, please let me share my chalk with you and we can coordinate because I and my partner cannot be in four places at the same time, but we'll try to show up also in some of these spaces. We could definitely, I think, encourage youth to take cell phone videos. We could set up a, at least a storage space too, where we're just like, you know, people can upload photos and stuff from the event so that um, even that, that I think would be great to sort of crowdsource. And um, if, if any of the youth want, you know, are really excited, they can, I would love for them to come and help you know, participate if they can, but they can share by right, you know, they could do a video, whatever they want to, um, to sort of document the experience. And then we can figure out in those two weeks, kind of what we want to highlight at the actual summit. But, and then sure, if it's like, they, they come back, they're like, yeah, do it. We can do it there also, but we don't have to put pressure on the hotel to, there's so many things need to happen for the summit that like, you know, this doesn't need to be like a major stress point from my perspective, like, um, so. Thank you. We will keep you posted, but I, I do think having something time simultaneous in multiple locations is also really dope. So yeah. I would say, even if we could keep that idea, I, I think. Yeah. That's really okay. I think we should do that for sure. And then if it makes sense and we chalk again, you know, um, and like I said, I'll look into trying to do a, a point park, um, see if Cat Cassie, our counseling center director had done one last fall. Um, but I think these, the other locations um, are, are to me more essential, um, but we can maybe sneak in some downtown space there. So cool. Thanks everybody. Um, other things, other updates from any organization, events that are going on, things that you want support on, awesome things happening in your life. <laughs> I just wanted to share, and maybe I can somehow share with you the flyer, um, PAR is having a back to school event um, Sunday, August 21st from 1 to 4 um, at the Circuit Center in the South Side. So there'll be a lot of free school supplies, free backpacks. Um, if people want to feel good about going back to school, there'll be 
gel manicures and natural hair styling stylists there, um, as well as just different other like therapeutic crafts and free food and cone ice and stuff like that. Um, so I'll try to send that flyer in the chat if anybody wants to share it. So we are um, Equines Girls, very, very, very well underway with our pre-diversion program um, that's being funded by DHS. It is going to look very similar to Bentley. Get back here. To um, it's it's going to be like a youth two one one or a parenting two one one. So it'll be a call line that will come through Gwen's Girls. Gwen's Girls staff will answer that call and then connect the family to whatever resources are identified for their needs. So it'll be a network of, um, the exciting thing is it won't just be your traditional formal supports, it will also be very non-traditional informal support. So like, you know, those, those men and women who are in our communities already doing this work, already organizing, already connected with the youth and the families, you know, some of the foot soldiers, so to speak, coaches, um, people who are unofficially mentoring in our communities, so that they will also be in our network of supports and our referral network, not just, again, those traditional, of course, the traditional will be in there. Um, it'll address issues such as truancy, parenting conflict, um, sports and recreation, um, Again, it's pre-diversion, so when schools have conflicts with kiddos fighting in the school, fighting in the community, then this would be that line that you would call to get that support and connect to those resources. So that is very much underway. We actually just last week solidified on a name. It'll be called Caring Connections for Youth. We have not solidified a phone number yet. We don't know if it is going to be like the 988 number where this would just go through that line and then connect you to us or if it'll be a separate line. Um, we kind of would, it would be easier for the rest of the world if it was just one number, either 911 or 988 and connect you to whatever you need to be connected to, but we don't know if that will actually work. And then just to kind of summarize today's and yesterday's, so I participated in the sequen sequential intercept mapping, which is literally mapping out the sequence of events that leads to incarceration, um, even playing down the line to reentry and what that might look like. But you know, when a call comes in, what are the first mapping out? What are the resources that we currently have here? And then what it looks like when a call comes in and 911 responds, um, looking at the co response model, looking at um, the CRIT, which is the, what is it, the um, crisis response intervention training that the police do or don't get. Um, revamping that, kind of refreshing that, and then really looking at where the gaps are, because there's a lot of gaps. One of the things that was overarching for every organization, which actually was already brought up in this meeting, is that every organization from, from dispatchers to nine, or from the dispatchers to EMS, to fire, to police, to, to, um, all of the service providers, including the Office of Community Health and Safety, their social workers, um, including Resolve, all of us are short staffed. All of us are very, very much stressed. All of us are, you know, suffering from the, the big resignation. And has very much impacted capacity, which has created really big problems in all of these. You know, we talked about um, schools, you know, everybody is impacted by capacity, which is an issue that needs to be addressed because, <clears throat> and we all know this, 
there is so much more mental health. There is so much more trauma in our community because of COVID, which is just laying on top of everything else that has impacted and increased trauma in our communities. Um, you know, we talked about the racial trauma, which is so increasing. Um, our kids are tired. Our parents are tired. Our teachers are tired. All of our systems are tired. All of our responders, providers are all tired. And the capacity issue is in making that even larger. So really, how do we address that? And there were some really great creative ideas, including like TikTok videos to help recruit in some of these disciplines and areas. And really looking at who was in the room versus who else needs to be in the room. So it was a great, um, it was very positive. It was um, very forward thinking. It was some old ideas being rebrought, but also a lot of new ideas. And, um, you know, we really, really think that this administration, as far as the mayor's office, is very much on board with this, very much doesn't want this to just be a meeting where we talk about a bunch of stuff, but actual stuff coming out of it, actual actionable items, and, and really taking this somewhere and really doing something with, um, you know, the community and police relations school and community relations, police and school relations, all of it. So it was, it was a great meeting to participate in. And there will be future meetings and there will be um, more people invited to the table and really expanding the stakeholders and um, again, some actionable steps. Thank you, Sarah, so much for those updates. Questions or other other updates from people in the group? I don't have any updates, but um, if we have a little bit of time, will we be able to start a document on the talking points? Sure, Since yeah, yeah. Since it seems like it's coming around the mountain when it comes. <laughs> also, Ms. Dawson, I want to say, I think with English teachers, one of the good thing about y'all too is you're, you're, the, you're the most likely to have read a book in that month as well, which I think which I think helps a little bit in some of these conversations. Um, that's coming from somebody who hasn't read a book in a year and a half, so. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll I'll share the screen, but also I'm happy to kind of take some notes as we go, at least of what we want here. We could definitely words methods we need to. Um, so some of the things that I got on here that I think will integrate some pieces of this into the letter, but we can put a more extensive thing in this document, and I'll make sure I share it with everybody. Um. The first piece is, I think, what we had talked about in terms of who's going to implement this. So making sure that we speak to that and in a longer, I think we can have a longer response about that, about the relationship between the school and these outside organizations. So who will implement the policy? Jose, do you remember what we called it in the report? Um, School-based and outside providers or something, I don't know. We did internal and external providers, I believe was the words we used earlier. It might be helpful because we can also, you know, link back to that constantly, right? Because we have evidence in there that there's both. We have evidence about the differences between them, so. Yeah, definitely. I think that's actually really smart to make sure we look back at the verbiage from the, mm -hmm. when we have. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think that consistent language is a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think linking this to the, the, the mental health piece and those, those trauma pieces as well as balance. Uh -huh. Yes. As, as well as the, you know, reproductive or not, or 
bodily autonomy and reproductive yeah. rights are all part of that too. Yeah, and I can ask uh, Melissa to even write a little bit more from Par's perspective and about like the, you know, a longer piece about sexual violence prevention and anybody can obviously, but I know she was sort of speaking to that. Um, Um, so other things, so this might be, we can distribute it to people who are going to write testimony, we can distribute it to kind of like, why should we do this, why should we support it, anything that we anticipate being pushed back that we want to provide a counter or like, you know, narrative to, we could, this could be a place to put that in, put this in here. I think probably defining um, developmentally appropriate, <laughs> like understanding that those yeah, <laughs> the, the full stop. Really <laughs> Defining yeah. that term. <laughs> yes, I love that. Defining developmentally appropriate. Is that what you said, Rachel? Yes. Thank you. Which I think maybe is similar to or related, I think we have multiple points, but about the, like where, you know, sex education is about more than sex, right? So for the like, oh, why are we talking about sex? It's like all these things. And then very clearly, like what does developmentally appropriate mean? Right, exactly. Yes, exactly. I love it. You Should we have a, what does culturally responsive mean? Like, do we need to, I mean, I know we need to explain that to people, <laughs> but do we, do we need to explain it in this document? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And I would say probably trauma informed too. And depending on how nuanced the document is, just sort of those could be combined in some way. Mm -hmm. Some of this is we have language already in the actual policy. So it's just helping everybody find it right here's what we're saying and just like giving giving people access to that um, we can definitely link to the report and see if there's a couple key statistics that we want to put in there i know kip had mentioned like or maybe it was joni somebody said uh, something about statistics might be helpful so if we want to put in there based on you know our report something we don't have to but that could be a, a talking point if we want in there And there is data, again, I don't know like what the lean is here, but depending on who we're talking to, um, there is data that comprehensive sex ed that students who do it wait longer to have sex. And so if that's what the, the goal is for parents, I think that's a valuable thing to know. Yeah. I think even just to expand on it, it's always not so pointed on that of just like, there, there, there are many positive outcomes, you know, when we look at, you know, from um, lower STI rates, um, prolonging sexual activity, safer sex, you know, using condoms when they do engage in sexual activity, you know, yeah. there's, there's a, a laundry list that I, I think, you know, um, uh, also just engagement, like we know like that it even, you know, when it's coming to school, it helps in engagement in school and grades and, mm -hmm. What, what was the word that you said, Jose, about, um, is it prolonged? It's not prolonged. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't sleep much. Uh, about later sexual activity, we used a word. Delayed, delayed, delayed. Delay. Thank you. But yeah, I love that. I think having a list of that, if a person is like, this is the, this is the benefit that's going to be sort of most persuasive, you know, they can, um, they can highlight that. healthier relationships. <laughs> um, um, so definitely we, I think kept spot on about one pushback could be, we can't, we don't have people to do it. 
are there other, I mean, you all who are in this space, are there other sort of like the broken record resistance argument that you think would be helpful for us to have a counter argument available to people here? It's the parent's job. That's the, um, well, we know that most of, the, most of the parents haven't gotten <laughs> good sex ed and not everybody has that. So we're, we're, we're not, we're not, re we're not replacing the parents. We are supplementing and, 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 and supporting parents and guardians. You know, this is not, instead of parents conversation, we're like adding that conversation and that parents are, parents and guardians are an essential part of this as well. Like we're not cutting them out of this. We, we want to include them. Thank you. We definitely should fix the language, but. And that's another, there is data on like students, youth wanting to have these conversations with their parents and guardians. And so like providing the, the information that can facilitate the types of conversations that youth really want to have with their caregivers, I think could be something there. There's something too in the, I think in the policy that, that y'all wrote that's really good about why public schools have a role in this. Like, so I wanna kind of pull that in. Um, but, and then I like that Rachel about, um, it could actually help promote conversations. Um, I would also say that um, students are already learning about sex. They're just learning the wrong things often. Oh, yes. From each other, they're uh -huh. the staff and teachers that are ill-equipped. So they're actually already actively digesting information. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm reaching my like five o'clock. I just want to be like, do you want me to learn from porn? But I know that's maybe not the. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? Like they are learning about it elsewhere. So yeah. Sorry, Jose, you were saying something. And also for the parent part, just it's not. It's, oh no, no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um. Uh. Not to start off with this, but I think acknowledging the fact like not every parent is safe to talk to about these things. Like, you know what I mean? Not everyone, not everyone has a parent in the household that is safe or appropriate to talk to, right? We know yeah. that unfortunately that's the case. Yeah. Never the thing I want to lead off on, but like I feel like yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's working. Please, I mean, everyone, you know, we'll, this, we will have more time with this document to wordsmith, so definitely um, change anything that I write. Um, but this is helpful to capture some of these things. I have to jump out for another meeting, but thank you guys so much. I will pass all of these links along to um, Christine and our team. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, absolutely. Have a good one. Thank you. Yeah, and it is. it does look like it's about that time, so... Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we have good move on this. So I'm, I'm, I definitely know I'm feeling even more inspired by everyone in the group. So. And Brittany, I'm about to yeah. put um, the three of us, you, Jose, and myself, in an email thread with Kathy, so we can schedule some time, hopefully next week, to just talk about strategy. Cool. That sounds great. Thank you. Tom's team in. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.